Okay. So um, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, my name is Joshua Boggs and I'm the designer and director of Framed. Um, we got a lot to get through, so we'll just run through it as quickly as possible. We don't have heaps of time. Um, so let's do it. So as I said, I'm Joshua Boggs. I'm a game designer and director. Prior to Framed, I've been in the industry for about eight years now. Uh, some of that time was spent at EA and various other studios, and I've been independent for about four of them. I've also been pretty fortunate to have won uh, some awards, and this talk is a bit about how we did that. Um, that's obviously not the rules to me. Um, one thing that's going to become clear in the talk is uh, I have a talent for, I guess, reading people, but reading them inside uh, a social system. Um, some may call that sociopathic, I just call it being aware of others and their motives. So, in case you don't know what Framed is, Framed is a noir puzzle game where you rearrange panels of a comic book to change the outcome of the story. As you can see, um, we've done pretty well, and let's go. So, it all starts with a choice, right? Every project you make is just a series of choices. This isn't rocket science. Those of us that make games know this well. We make choices that impact the game and its development every single day. Things like, what is this game about? How will people find my game? How will I make money from my game? And something that Bruce talked about a couple years ago, what makes my game remarkable? These are all very valid and important questions. However, there is one question, one choice that developers often don't ask themselves, and it is this. How do I want my game to be perceived? This is an important distinction because, as we know in game development, we have a large control over many things, but not necessarily what happens once it's out in the wild. But that's not entirely true because every choice you make about your game during development, during release, during pre-production, is you subtly speaking to the public, to curators, app store editors, about how they should perceive your game. This is the essence of what PR and marketing is, right? Hundreds of billions of dollars are spent every year to try and create a favorable message, a favorable reaction to a product. And your game is no different, obviously. So, this talk is about taking control of what you say. You'll hear me speak a lot about the decisions you made during development and the particular tactics we used. But if you pay attention, you'll notice that even among those development-focused choices is a common theme and that theme is that every choice we made was deliberately focused on tailoring, tailoring the public perception of Framed prior to release. So, what choices do we make? Well, firstly, we're going to make a very different kind of game, obviously. Um, something that could be recognized in a single screenshot. Something incredibly striking and carefully designed. It needed to be recognizable at a pub, on the tram, or on the subway. It had to get people come up to you and ask you, what is that game you're playing in public? Secondly, we were going to distinguish ourselves from the kind of lo-fi fad going on at the time uh, by handcrafting every part of uh, every piece of art, every piece of animation for every panel and level. We felt that this would send a message that this was like a really high quality product and a really high quality game. And we, uh, we doubled down on this by actually focusing on Apple rather than um, PC. PC was the dominant platform at the time, but we felt that kind of pairing of the interface and the careful design um, and just the kind of uh, experience of using an Apple product would be a great pairing. And most importantly, we we're going to focus our PR efforts on winning awards on the festival circuit. So for anyone who's not aware, real quick, what is the festival circuit? Put simply, the festival circuit is a season of exhibitions, conferences, and award shows that you can submit your game to. These shows take place all around the world, and if you are successful in being picked as a finalist or a showcase game, you get free booth space and the opportunities to network with distributors, app store editors, publishers, fans, and obviously journalists. But that's not the only goal of pursuing this route. Or I should say, that's not the real goal of committing to the festival circuit. Because the festival circuit is really about shaping the perception of your game. By being at festivals, award shows, and official selections, you do two things. First, you add that coveted award wreath to your marketing materials. 
And this further enhances that perception of quality and hypeness around your game. There it is. Look at it. How lovely. <laughs> Two, you're marketing directly to tastemakers. These are your, cur these are your curators, the, co the connoisseurs, the YouTubers, and journalists. They are at these shows. It's their job to be at these shows. And their voices are bigger than yours can ever be. You just don't have the same time and resources as someone like EA or Ubisoft, so you need to spend your time as effectively as possible. Everything you're doing needs to be hitting two birds with one stone. And this is the one-two punch of the festival circuit. You increase hype and expectations around your game by frequently appearing at shows as a successful title. This allows you to bring, uh, this allows you to bring in those with larger influence in you to market your game for you to the rest of the world. But this, in turn, helps build more hype around your game, which means that when you do submit to the next show, chances are that those judges and show, show curators have heard about your game and are a lot more likely to check it out. This positive PR feedback loop is pivotal th to cutting through the noise and shaping the perception of your game as something that is a must-have quality title. So for those that aren't aware, um, this is just a quick run-through of a bunch of events um, in the festival circuit. Um, these are the ones that we kind of focused on, but um, there's more festivals every year that are opening up. Um, and I could not recommend more the two URLs at the bottom, uh, gameconfs.com and promoterapp.com. Uh, Promoter app, without it, we probably would have missed a lot of this and we probably wouldn't have done as well as we did. Um, it sends you like really awesome reminders. It's, it's great. Really check it out. So, aside from the main goal of shaping the perception around your game, festival circuits also provide a number of other great benefits. The first one that uh, lets you gauge the public perception of your game. Have people already heard about the game? What are people saying about it when they see your logo, your banner? Do they turn to their friend and say, oh, this is that game framed, or this is you know, Hyperlight, or this is whatever game you're working on? If they do, then you're on the right track. Free interviews, obviously. If you're selected, you're given a free booth, and that lets journalists and media outlets just vox pop you right at your booth. And uh, pretty important is free playtesting. Uh, if you're going to be maintaining that perception of value and quality, you need to be taking in as much feedback as possible. This doesn't mean hounding people afterward. Oftentimes, it's just about listening to their faces, their body language, and others around them watching them as they play. Reading these cues and matching them with what's going on is normally a service you'd pay a fair amount of money for. Attending as many shows as possible also allows you to test it among different audiences. For example, the PAX crowd is very, very different to the South by Southwest crowd. South by Southwest is more like a general mainstream or public event, whereas PAX is clearly PAX. So talking about the benefits of the festival circuit is all well and good. But with the bar always rising, particularly the competition inside the festival circuit, your game really needs to stand out and cut through the noise. It needs to be very, very polished. This means that people often don't start submitting to shows and competitions till the game is either finished or in beta. However, it is possible, uh, sorry, sorry, it is possible to maintain that quality throughout development. Remember, you want to shape that perception of quality, and the best way to do that over a long period of time is to submit to as many festivals as possible. So, here are the development strategies that we employed to allow us to continuously submit frames to competitions and award shows, allowing us to shape that perception throughout the entire development. So the core tenet we've upheld is to ensure that you're developing your game to a timeline that adheres to the festival circuit's award show, so their submissions and their showings. That means you need to always have a submission quality build on hand, no matter what. Here are some of the ways we did that. So number one, your imagination is the best prototype. Um, Playtest your entire game on paper or Lego or anything faster than a computer. You want that turnaround between design and experience to be as immediate as writing or painting. Video game creation has a long turnaround time between creation and experience, but game design doesn't really need to be. Simulate it in your mind if possible. You need to make that turnaround between inception and execution as fast as physically possible. Then, once you've done that, playtest it on others. Let them imagine the world you've left out. 
because you'll be surprised by the results and it will force you to ensure that your designs are very readable and very intuitive. Number two, um, this one's a bit controversial, but assume everything is final and don't create placeholder assets. Um, by not using placeholder assets, uh, the idea is that, sorry, ensure that you're not just using placeholder assets. The idea is more than the mechanic. The idea is about how the aesthetics, the themes, the mechanics all come together. The magic that happens when they all interplay, that is the feeling that you have in your imagination. That is the core idea of your game oftentimes. So doing work in progress placeholders often doesn't give that feeling. Identify which parts are not essential and leave them to later. But make sure you do not discard the feeling that you're trying to capture. Many people throw out everything except the system of mechanics when they do this, but doing that is just throwing out the baby with the bathwater. The game is the feeling you're trying to capture. For example, The Witness, right? Is it just a series of puzzles with nice art? It's, it's more than that. It's a feeling of both mystery and zen, an idea that logic and spirituality are one and the same thing. And all the mechanics and themes are trying to give you, you know, a, a general grasp of that idea. Number three, the only milestones are submission deadlines. There's usually about 10 weeks between each major expo and award show. This is how long it should take you to make significant improvements and add additional content. If it takes longer, your pipeline's a bit too slow. You'll be submitting your polished build to as many festivals as possible while maintaining the trajectory of your project. The only way to do that is obviously to treat award submissions as your major milestones. And 10 weeks is the magic number. It's not some arbitrary, random, optimal time I've plucked out. It is literally the time between the biggest and most important award shows that you can get into. And they're all in different parts of the world. You'll often find them seasonal as well. Uh, IGF, GDC, we are here now. South by Southwest, PAX East are all in this you know, earlier part of the year. And in the middle of the year, you've got Gamescom, Eurogamer, Tokyo Game Show as well, I think, unless that's moved out. Um, they're all seasonal and you usually have about 10 weeks between each major one. And the other one is to develop your game episodically, if you can, regardless of if it really is. What you're really doing here, so, so for Frame, for example, 30% of our 10-week turnarounds were spent carefully and quickly designing everything that would happen, the feeling we were trying to capture. Mechanics and aesthetics are mechanisms to achieve that feeling, but not the end goal themselves. So focus on that higher feeling, a quality title is really carefully and deliberately designed. We spent our 10-week deadline as follows. Three weeks carefully designing all content, six weeks creating final assets, and then one week for review and polish. And this allowed us to build in final chunks or many polished prototypes over and over and over again. By adopting this method, you give yourself the ability to submit continuously throughout development whilst building the entirety of your game. Not only that, it means that when you hit the end, you're either A, done, or B, have just one more sprint to do, one more 10-week turnaround to bring everything together. So make a game episodically, regardless of if it is. Your goal is to finish as many vertical slices as quickly as possible. Um, this one's kind of obvious, but everyone's a hipster. Uh, bring everyone in, bring others in early. Uh, your goal here isn't just for feedback, it's to bring in influential people to talk about, to talk about your game for you, uh, and for them to become familiar with the game. For Frame, this, started, this actually started back uh, in 2011 or 2012 when we first submitted the super rough prototype to IGF. It obviously didn't get accepted, but the point was so that there were a few people uh, who were judges or um, jurors would see the game and then in future would recognize the game and, and that would help us further down the path of the festival circuit. Um, this one's a little hack I like. It's, uh, visual polish is important, but not as important as audio. So the thing with aesthetics is it creates atmosphere and emotional target. And great audio design will lift every single aspect of your game. So if you have great audio early, not only does it lift the entire experience, but the game feels more polished and finished since audio is usually left to the end of a project. So. Once you've nailed your strategies and submission processes to shows and awards, excuse me, it's time to manage your show floor presence. Again, this is about shaping that perception of quality. So the first thing you want to do is control your crowd. Nothing draws people in like a crowd. So the first piece of advice is to cycle your devices. 
this is so important, particularly if you are showing a mobile game. Uh, it gives you the unique ability to vary the number of devices you have out on your booth. Nothing draws people in like a crowd, like I said, so start with a device or two out on the table, then only add more as the crowd becomes too large to manage. Importantly, you should only remove a device, though, if the crowd is sort of lessening to agree that it's unable to sustain itself. You always want a little bit of crowd, and you want players to actually wait a turn so that they draw in more viewers and more people. Doing this during the circuit means that when uh, editors or journalists or anyone comes by, they'll see the crowd and are a lot more likely to check your game out. Always have one more spare build. So all that said, you never know when someone from developer relations or an editor or anyone or the media will come around. You want to make sure that you make the most of your time at your booth. Uh, so you want to always make sure that you have a spare, uh, sorry, a spare device on hand. Um, and you never hand this out to the public. This way you can jump in and begin the interview or begin pitching a game immediately. One time we were at PAX event showing Framed and uh, Jerry from Penny Arcade walked past. Um, so knowing that the comic crossover would work well, I grabbed our spare device, ran over to him. That resulted in coverage on the front of Penny Arcade the next day and him kind of telling everyone to go check out Framed the following day. So always have a spare build there. And know who's on the show floor. Um, but also treat everyone like they could be a tastemaker, because there are a number of people who do walk around without their badges, just so that they don't get hounded. Um, this is my favorite one, is uh, be a member of the crowd. Um, it's often really hard to get honest feedback about your game, and some people even carefully manage their facial expressions, not to offend you. Um, so infiltrate the crowd, remove your badge or hide it, and move to the rear or the side of the crowd. Watch them, see how the players react to your game, and listen to the conversations that bystanders have as well. You can gain a lot of really, really valuable insight this way. This one's a bit um, controversial, but uh, open dialogue where they can critique the game. Um, obviously, if you ask someone their opinion, um, people like that, and they like to feel smart, so they'll often tell you what you want. But if that doesn't work, you can call them out nicely on their frustration you observed when you were masquerading as a member of the crowd. The emotional desire in people to defend themselves will always kind of outweigh their cognitive practice of masking their emotions or desires. So you can use that to your advantage, but only if you do it in a really nice way that's not confrontational. So this process, this systematic approach to the festival circuit was what we employed for Framed. So how did it turn out for us? Well, as you saw before, it went pretty well. But it's important to remember that the festival circuit, or award circuit, is a system. And like any system, if you understand how it works, it can be gamed and bent to your advantage. So, bearing all that in mind, our launch must have been pretty successful, right? Well, we launched Framed in November 2014, had significant critical acclaim. By the time we released, everything seemed to be on track. Apple were ready. Um, they wanted to know our release date. We had translated the game to 14 languages. And um, it did go all right. Um, we got some feature spots in China and Japan and Australia, um, and sort of just above the fold. So you know those first four that you normally see on the App Store. Um, we moved 20,000 units in the first weekend, and by the end of the first week, we'd moved 35,000. So at five dollars a pop for a premium indie title, we weren't doing half bad, but we were really underperforming our expectations quite seriously. Um, and with a budget of almost half a million Australian dollars, um, half of it being salary sacrificed, so it wasn't really that much spent. Um, cost and budget are different. Um, we were looking at only breaking even at cost. Um, we had a team of four to six people, we had investors to pay back, and with a game so hyped and so critically acclaimed uh, with expectations of success so high, this is bad news for us. So. What, what went wrong with our launch? Why was our launch internally a failure? Well, the thing with releasing anything is there is always a huge amount of luck involved. Anyone who tells you otherwise or who says that they succeeded in launching because they did X, Y, Z in a very specific order is glossing over a huge fact that they likely don't want to admit, that they also got extremely lucky. We don't like to talk about it because it sounds hopeless, right? If it's all just a gamble, what's the point? What's the use of shaping that message of quality, of 
pouring blood, sweat and tears into your project, excuse me, into your baby if it's all just a roll of the dice anyway. And that's certainly one way to look at it. You are literally taking your entire game budget, walking into the casino and dumping the two, three, even four years of your life onto the table. But there's a huge element of luck because in any release, there are a huge amount of variables that are completely out of your control. You've done all the preparations, but you can't really predict the weather. Now you just gotta hope no storm rolls in. That a large game franchise doesn't unexpectedly drop on that day, or make a huge announcement, or that the media in general aren't consumed by some other scandal at the time, or that tastes have changed. Or that your app store editor who's championed your game suddenly leaves their job. So just don't make games. <laughs> Honestly, it's not worth it. Um, okay, jokes aside though. Um, as PR is not a silver bullet. Uh, it's about tipping the odds of success in your favor. Your goal isn't to have fine grained control over your release. It's impossible to do that. Your goal is to tip those odds at the house in your favor. Every release is a gamble, and all the work that you've been doing to make your game great, to shape that perception of value, bringing in those tastemakers will help tip the odds further in your favor. You want to walk into that metaphorical casino and have all the dealers wanting you to win. Still a high stakes gamble, but your end goal is to slowly but surely tip those odds in your favor. So if everything goes well and you've managed to luck out, congratulations. But um, what if it doesn't? What do you do if the odds don't go your way? Well, the reason I've talked so much about shaping that perception of quality, of value, is that by doing so, not only do you create a great game, but it's also insurance. A quality game is the best defense against a bad launch, because the long tail of your game will continue to bring in people seeking quality experiences. So those that aren't aware, um, just real quick, the long tail is this part in the typical sales graph. Um, it largely stays uh, steady, and you can earn just as much money from it um, as you launch, if not more. Um, and this is so, and pricing helps with this, along with all the messaging and work that you've done prior to release on the circuit. Trailers, interviews, streams, and importantly, those award rates. How many times have you been looking for a quality movie to watch and made a decision based off of the critical acclaim it has? I do it all the time. I'm sure many of you do as well. We make judgments based off the reputations of respected people, of tastemakers. The festival circuit not only helps in pre-release hype, it's also an essential ingredient in maintaining a sustain sustainable long tail after release. So if your launch doesn't go your way, you still have a decent long tail to look forward to. While we had certain things not go our way during launch, we also had a lot of things do, you know, that did go our way. That's kind of just the nature of luck, right? Kojima's Game of the Year endorsement was a great example of influential tastemakers weighing in. It was lucky that he saw it at that point in time. Apple continually re-feature framed in smaller features, sales and bundles. And we're not the only title that has done pretty well in the long tail. Our friends at Comovius have done similarly well for Duet, and I'm sure that there's many others who've done well in the long tail. So the theory of the long tail is obviously that our culture and economy is shifting away from that big spike and towards niches. And due to how our games are largely digitally distributed, and how widely accessible our games have become through our phones, we and many others have made more on our long tail than our launch period spike, almost 10 times as much. Currently, we're now sitting at almost 400,000 paid units, almost 18 months after release. We get featured regularly in minor feature bundles and sales with Apple. China is actually our top performing country. Why? Because we're filling gaps where others don't try to. We ensured that the design stage of the game was intuitive and readable. On the festival circuit, another great thing about it is that we did travel to many countries, China included, Japan, and being able to gauge how people can play a game with that language barrier or culture barrier. So premium pricing does still work on iOS, but it's not easy. To make it work, you need to invest heavily in shaping your game as a premium experience and ensure it's accessible to everyone. You're seeking to fill gaps. Our audience are connoisseurs. They want well-crafted, carefully designed experiences. The premium market does work, you just need to shift your perspective away from what everyone else is doing. You won't get the same numbers as free to play, but we're playing a different game. We have a different scale of measurement. 
for those of us crafting premium titles on mobile, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. Thank you. I'm not sure if we have time for questions. I think we do. Kill five minutes, yeah. Uh, do you, I think you have to line up at the thing here. Hey, um, considering the long tail, I'm curious uh, if the um, festival circle uh, is relevant after a launch of the game. I mean, you launched, mm. and then do you still try to go to these events? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. We, uh, so the question was, is the festival circuit um, still valid after you've released? Um, good question. Uh, I know a lot of people who have still done it a lot, um, like Necrodance is still uh, go on the circuit and continually do well. It shows well. Um, we particularly haven't done it, um, but I can only imagine that it helps bolster that long tail, yeah. Thank you. Hey there, Joshua. So uh, my question relates to um, anyone who's interested in making games but maybe doesn't actually have the capital to mm. get to the stage that you are at. How does the festival circuit enable uh, those type of game designers? Because obviously at GDC, we get to see a lot of um, like games jam games and smaller sort of uh, stands, but is there any way that games like that, in your experience, have ever achieved those accreditations and should they even be seeking those kind of things? Yeah, um, so, so the question was, um, do the, uh, for people with less money, is the festival circuit still something that you, want to, that you should pursue? Um, I'd argue yes, because um, the goal of the festival circuit is to be submitting to these things um, in all, and if you are accepted um, as, you know, like a showcase game or you, they're going to give you, they, they usually give you a free booth. Um, so it's a really good way to get free playtesting and free booths. Um, you still have the, the problem of travel and everything, um, but I guess that's kind of one of the, uh, you know, facts about making games, I guess, is that it costs money or time and time is money. So. But you wouldn't say there's a glass ceiling in the sense that no, you could I don't come think, here? And, yeah, 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 I don't feel there is, no. Cool, thank yeah. you. Hey, so thanks for a great talk. No, cheers. Uh, so even despite all the hard work you get, you went into putting the festival circuit and getting awarded on there, the initial launch was a little underwhelming, as you said, and it was only the long-term quality that helped create the awesome long tail. Looking back on that, was there something you misjudged with the initial festival response that may, might have contributed to that? And if so... Are you trying to work on that for your next project? Mm. So the question was, was there something wrong I had done? Or well, not wrong, but like misjudged during the circuit, right? Yeah. Um, to contribute to the launch. Um, that's a good question. I mean, you can always look back and say, I wish it did X, Y, or Z um, better. Um, but to be honest, I think that we did as well as we could do. And we, we did do pretty well. But, um, you know, I, th I think sometimes... You know, like I was saying, when you release something, there's a huge amount of luck involved. Um, it's not a nice thing to hear or talk about because it sounds hopeless, but I, I don't really believe it is. You're just trying to tip the odds in your favor. Sometimes it doesn't go exactly the way you want. And that's just kind of a fact of life. Thank you. Cheers. Cool. I think that's it. Thanks for coming, everyone.